Babbel is a language learning app which provides award-winning courses in languages such as French, Spanish, Italian, German, Dutch and many more. I've always been passionate about becoming fluent in another language and Babbel is helping me achieve that. I'm continuing to study Spanish and Italian on the app daily, which has helped enormously in retaining vocabulary and grammar, with lots of exciting activities available in reading, writing, listening and speaking, most of which are only 10 minutes per lesson. I currently attend university where a number of my classmates are not from the UK. Some are from Spain, Germany and Finland. So it's fun to have a few conversations with them in their own language. As well as having achieved a certificate in both Spanish and Italian thanks to Babbel, I've made connections to family over in the USA who speak Spanish and have utilised what I have learned on Babbel to communicate with them. I definitely feel much more confident in my abilities, all thanks to Babbel. Unlike several other language learning apps on the market, the content made by Babbel has been made by genuine speakers of the languages and they don't work by any sort of algorithm or computer generated material. The content is also enormously useful as it prepares the learner for real life situations, such as asking for directions or ordering food at a restaurant. Another fantastic aspect of Babbel is that there are no adverts and you can participate in lessons offline as well. Doing a mere 15 minutes of Babbel per day will have you speaking a new language in just a few weeks and further your learning with new upgrades to the Babbel app, such as short stories, culture clips, a podcast and Babbel Live, where you can add live classes to your existing subscription for an additional fee or just subscribe to them as a standalone product. Babbel now offers a 20-day money-back guarantee on all its subscriptions, meaning you can rest assured knowing you can try out the app with no financial commitment. To get this amazing offer, head to the link in the description below to get 65% off a Babbel subscription with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Thank you so much once again to Babbel for sponsoring today's video. Barry Carlton Woodley was born on December 1st, 1945 in Josephine, Oregon and married Lynn Janet Johnson from Bend on September 11th, 1964. The 18-year-old couple went on to have four children, Anne-Marie, Gregory, Jeremy and Rebecca. The Woodleys lived at an address on the 8100 block of Brighton Place in the upper middle class Houston suburb of Cypress, Harris County, North West Texas. They were known to be a very religious family and were law abiding citizens by all accounts who never caused any trouble. By the early 1990s, Father Barry was 45 years old and had been happily married to Lynn for 27 years. Their eldest child, Anne-Marie, was 25, married and had two children of her own by this point, with their youngest daughter, Rebecca, being 14. Barry worked as a project mechanical engineer at the Bechtel Corporation and Lynn herself also worked in the same industry. The couple were extremely hardworking and all of their efforts went towards caring and providing for their family. Gregory John Woodley, the couple's eldest son, was born on August 16th, 1968 and by September of 1991 was 23 years old and working as a stockbroker for Lehman Brothers Incorporated. 
He had graduated from the University of Texas the year prior in 1990 and was also engaged to a 21-year-old woman named Natalie, with whom Gregory had dated for around two and a half years by this time. The couple became engaged in August of 1991. Barry and Lynn's youngest son, Jeremy Joel Woodley, was born on April 13th, 1976, in Walnut Creek, Contra Costa, California. At 15 years of age, he was a sophomore at Cy Fair, Cypress Fairbanks High School, and he was a very talented swimmer, competing on the school team. From the outside world, the Woodleys were a completely normal family who led completely normal, everyday lives. On Wednesday the 25th of September 1991, the Woodleys had a visit from a 16-year-old boy named Shelby who was stopping by the home to view a piano which the Woodley family were selling for around $2,250. Lynn had placed a classified ad for the piano in the Houston Chronicle just a few days prior. It's unknown exactly which members of the Woodley family showed the piano to this potential buyer. Regardless, Shelby left the property and the following day on September 26th, he called the Woodley residence at approximately 6.45pm, stating that he had decided to purchase the piano and that he was going to collect it and paid what he owed that evening. Approximately one hour later, at 7.45pm, Lynn left the home to pick up the youngest daughter, Rebecca, from swimming practice, intending to also collect a friend's daughter, Devin McGlynn, who was also friends with Rebecca, and was planning to also take her home. Fifteen minutes later, at 8pm, neighbours recalled witnessing Barry sprinkling the lawn, and inside the residence, 15-year-old Jeremy was on the phone to one of his friends and fellow swim teammate, David McGlynn, who was the older brother of Devin. A call which concluded at around 8.20pm. According to David, Jeremy seemed to be his usual self and nothing appeared to be amiss. Greg was also home at this time. He was fresh out of university and was trying to save money for his upcoming wedding. At around 8.40pm, whilst travelling back from the swimming pool with her youngest daughter, Lynn dropped Devin back at her home, which was located within close proximity to the Woodley residence. Lynn and Rebecca then arrived back at the house around 5 to 10 minutes later. At around 9pm, the neighbours heard a woman's screams coming from the Woodley residence, and it was Lynn, screaming as she ran out of the house onto the street. She had entered the residence, only to find the lifeless bodies of her husband, Barry, and her two sons, Gregory and Jeremy, lying on the living room floor, all lined up, kneeling face down on cushions on the floor. Both Gregory and Jeremy had their legs bound together with a nylon cord, the origins of which remains unknown. All three men had been shot in the back of the head numerous times with a .22 calibre revolver, shot at point-blank range. Because of the excessive amount of shots fired, 13 in total, this indicated overkill. It was possible that more than one assailant was involved in the crime. According to Sergeant Skip Oliver of the Harris County Sheriff's Department, the killings had been carried out, quote, quickly and professionally, indicating that the killings appeared to have been carried out by some sort of hitman or someone who had experience of such slayings before. Oliver stated, quote, whoever came over there, the Woodley residents, came over there to kill them. The fact that no neighbours heard any gunshots coming from the residence that night 
also corroborated this theory that it was carried out by a professional. The Woodley home was subsequently cordoned off by police as the crime scene was thoroughly investigated. The evening following the murders, investigators set off fingerprint bombs in the Woodley home in order to find any of the assailant's fingerprints or any significant stains, such as blood or mud from shoe prints, something which was carried out early the next morning using lasers. The outcome of this particular operation was not released to the public, nor any information regarding forensic evidence which had been collected, such as DNA, fibres or fingerprints. It was theorised by investigators that the murders played out as follows. The perpetrator or perpetrators entered the Woodley residence sometime between 8.25 and 8.48pm. They somehow then managed to gather Barry, Greg and Jeremy in the living room. Barry then sat on the fireplace as the gun was being pointed to his head by the killer. Barry likely begged for his son's lives at this time, according to those who knew what kind of man he was, always putting his family first. According to true crime, real life stories of abduction, addiction, obsession, murder, grave robbing and more, a book written by David McGlynn, Jeremy's swimming teammate, Blood spatters at the crime scene suggested that 23-year-old Gregory was the first to be shot, with three bullet wounds penetrating his skull, closely followed by his younger brother, 15-year-old Jeremy, who was shot four times in the back of the head. There was forensic evidence to suggest that Barry had been beaten with the handle of the gun before being made to kneel beside his sons. He was then subsequently shot six times with the .22 calibre revolver. The assassination was silent and because of the weapon used, no shell casings were left behind. Following the murders, which is believed to have taken place within a mere 10 minute time frame, the perpetrators left the home silently and swiftly, closing the door behind them before disappearing into the darkness, leaving no trace behind. One of the most intriguing pieces of evidence found at the home was a piece of paper which simply had the date of the murders written on it. It was alleged that the note was written in Barry Woodley's handwriting with investigators citing the possibility that this piece of paper may have simply been a receipt for the piano they were selling. Perhaps Barry was writing the receipt when he was attacked by the perpetrator. Many speculated that the potential buyer of the piano, the 16-year-old boy who identified himself as Shelby, was somehow involved in the murders, but despite authorities trying to trace him down, he has never been located. Also, it was deemed extremely unlikely that one 16-year-old boy could overpower three grown men who were older and much stronger than him even if he did have a gun in his possession. It's unclear whether the phone number that the boy used to call the Woodleys was ever traced. It's also unknown if Shelby even showed up at the residence on the night in question, as the piano was still present in the home following the murders, and nothing appeared to have been stolen. There was also no evidence of the property having been ransacked in any way. The assailant or assailants also did not enter the home by forced entry, meaning that they may have been willingly let into the property by Barry, Greg or Jeremy, or the assailant got into the house through an unlocked door or window. Unfortunately, because we do not know which members of the family showed Shelby the piano on the 25th, we don't know his physical description, making it much more difficult, seemingly impossible, for the youth to ever be traced down. No composite sketches were ever released to the public. The police didn't have anything to work with. 
No motive whatsoever could ever be established in this case. Robbery was initially considered, though it still hasn't been ruled out despite nothing having been taken from the home. The perpetrator may have been intending on robbing the property, but somehow was disturbed and fled. Though the murders themselves do seem to be premeditated in some way, especially within such a short time frame. The 16-year-old boy could have also been some sort of informant. Whilst viewing the piano, he may have been discreetly surveying the Woodley property for such purposes as burglary, noting any expensive items the family owned to perhaps report back to his superiors, but this is only a theory at this stage. The three Woodley men themselves had absolutely no known enemies, and even Greg's fiancée Natalie stated in a newspaper article published in the Houston Chronicle that, quote, none of them had any enemies. Everybody loved them. The motive for this crime has simply left authorities baffled. The Woodleys weren't involved in any criminal activity, they didn't owe anyone any money, and each member of the family appeared to be living successful lives. Could this particular case be one of mistaken identity? Or did something happen behind the scenes that we simply don't know about? There is no plausible explanation as to why such a callous and calculated crime was committed. During their inquiries, police contacted a number of people who had responded to the Woodley's piano ad in the newspaper, but once again without much success. They questioned a number of neighbours who reported seeing two Caucasian males in a white sedan around the time of the murders near to the Woodley home, though they have never been identified and it is unknown if they are at all connected to the crime. The fact of the matter remains that three young men's lives were tragically cut short in the most unimaginable of circumstances. What led to their demise remains a mystery, though their memory has not been forgotten by those who loved them the most. Barry, Greg and Jeremy were laid to rest in Decker Prairie Cemetery in Montgomery County, Texas, following a memorial service on Monday the 30th of September 1991. Lynn Woodley passed away on August 7th, 2004 in Houston, without knowing the truth about what happened to her husband and two sons. The case continues to baffle authorities and web sleuths alike. Was this Shelby character responsible for the trio's deaths? If so, what was his motive? Why hire a professional hit on a seemingly normal family? What had they done, if anything? Was this a case of mistaken identity? So much about this case doesn't make sense. We can only hope that the more attention this case gets, the more progress can be made and justice can finally prevail for Barry, Gregory and Jeremy.